Hello. Thank you for watching, listening this morning. I pray that the message you are about to hear will strengthen you in your faith. I pray it will encourage you in your walk with Jesus. If you have any questions that I could answer, please feel free to send me an email. My email is pepper at fbcmv.com. So now, enjoy the message this morning. Take your Bible and open it to James chapter 1 and find verse 13. James chapter 1, find verse 13. I'm in a series of messages that I'm calling Swing Your Sword, Conquering the Temptations in Life. And we began last Sunday morning talking about what is true about temptation, what's not true about temptation. And today, we're just simply going to talk about what to know about temptation. And we find that in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Follow along as I read these verses. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished or fully grown is the idea, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, sistren. Every good thing given and every gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Scott Smith faced a real dilemma this week. He asked for a $20 bill and received two of them. They were stuck together. He asked for one and received two. And he is tempted to keep both of them. Is he morally obligated to be honest and confess? Or can he just stay silent about it and keep the extra 20 bucks and never tell Kathy, his wife, who gave them to him? Now, we, we, we smile at that, but the truth is the temptations that you face are indeed serious. What tempts you? What is the toughest thing for you to resist? Now, I'm not talking about Bluebell because at the prices that I saw yesterday, over eight bucks, it's no longer a temptation for me to buy Bluebell. It is not at all. But, but seriously, what do you struggle against? The temptation to burst out in anger? The temptation to jealousy? The temptation to lie and bend the truth or maybe for you it's the lure of immorality or the enticement of alcohol and drunkenness or, or your biggest struggle may be against materialism where you put things in the place that the Lord Jesus belongs in your life or it could be that you struggle with pride which leads you to be critical of others or defensive when others seek to correct you. Holy Spirit land on you yet in any of those areas? Well, today I want us to enter temptation headquarters. And I want you to look and know about the plans to attack you. Last week we looked at what is true about temptation and what is not. And here in the verses that I read a moment ago, we're going to examine what you need to know about temptation. You need to know how temptations come at you. So here's, here's my life point. Be in the know and temptation must go. Be in the know and temptation must go. Look at these verses that I read just a moment ago. We're going to divide them into three different sections, and you can see them there on the outline there up on the screen. Here's what you must know about temptation. Three concepts, three pieces of inside information to help you discern how temptation comes at you. You have to know the details, and that's verse 13. 
You have to know the process, and that's verses 14 and 15. And you have to know the truth. That's verses 16 and 17. So let's begin by looking at knowing the details about temptation. Know the details about temptation. Look at verse 13. Would you underline or circle in your Bible the word when? Because the text does not say if you are tempted. The text says when you are tempted. So, as you can see on the screen there, temptation is inevitable. That is the first detail. You cannot eradicate temptation from your life. And you will, I said this last week, let me say it again. And you will not be, never be held accountable just for being tempted. You are responsible, though, for how you respond to temptation. How you react to temptation. You cannot keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said that. You cannot keep the birds from flying over your hair, flying over your head. Temptation is inevitable. You can keep them, though, from building a nest in your hair. So temptation is inevitable. Here's the second one. Temptation is never directed by God. Temptation does not come from God. Look at verse 13 again. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. You cannot say, I am being tempted by God. Now, human nature is to do that. Human nature is to blame someone else. And that tendency to blame someone else is as old as the Garden of Eden. Can I refresh your memory to Genesis chapter 3? When the Lord confronted Adam and Eve with their giving in to temptation and taking the bite, thus disobeying God, when questioned, what did Adam say? The woman you gave me. Adam is trying to lay the blame at God's feet. Shifting it off of himself. He first says, yes, the woman. But he ultimately says, whom you gave me. Adam is accusing God of setting him up. Here I was, God, all by myself. I was, I was enjoying myself, all the bounty and the, and the beauty of the garden. And along came this woman, Lord, the one you brought into my life. And if it hadn't have been for her, I would not be in this predicament. And then what did Eve say? When the Lord turned his attention to Eve, what did Eve say? It's the snake's fault. He deceived me. And the implication is, Lord, you created that snake. You created him, Lord. Now, today we may not be as bold as to blame God directly like that. We, we may not be as bold as to blame God just that boldly for our sin, but we do it indirectly. We want to blame our genes. You know, I was just born with a hot temper. My pappy was a pistol and I'm a son of a gun. I mean, just, I got this bad temper from my dad. Or, or maybe you got it from your mom. I, I, I don't know. We want to blame our genes. We also want to blame maybe the environment, how we were raised. Or we just simply want to say, I can't help it. God, you made me this way. No, God tempts no one. He never solicits a single believer to do anything that is immoral. He never causes, tempts a single believer to do anything that is sinful. To do so would be inconsistent with his character. Because God is entirely free from evil. No part of his character, no part of God's actions contain the slightest hint of evil. Now God tries men and women, yes, but he never tempts his children to sin. And so just to sum up this first one, God does not tempt men and women with a view of drawing them into sin. Temptation does not come from God. So know the details. Temptation is inevitable, 
And temptation is never directed by God. The second thing, be in the know. And temptation must go. Must go. Know the process. So, what's the process if temptation is never directed by God? Look, look at verse 14. But each one, circle that or underline that, is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Underline that. Temptation is an individual matter. Sinful behavior originates in the heart of every individual. It is a very personal matter. And while I told you last week the temptations that you face are common to man, which means they're not just extraordinary or you're the only one ever dealing with this kind of temptation, that is true. But temptation is different for everybody. Now here's what I mean. What tempts one person may not tempt at all another person. Each of us is responsible for our, for our own desires. Some of you never struggle with the temptations that I face. No matter how strong that temptation becomes, no matter how strong the pull is in your life, you're never going to lie. You're never going to lose your temper. Those things are just no temptation at all to you. But on the other hand, I never struggle with what tempts you. No matter how strong the temptation, no matter how much the pressure, no matter how strong the lure and the pull is, I'm never going to root for the Houston Astros. And, and in, fact, in fact, if it's the World Series with the Astros and you see me wearing a turban, you'll know that the Astros are playing Pakistan. Not going to do it. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed. Those are fishing terms. Lured away and enticed by his own lust. The imagery there is of trying to catch that big bass with the perfect bait. Got a picture of that for you. See that right there? There it is. There it is. You are that fish. And Satan has just dangled in front of you something that looks delicious to you. Carried away, lured away is what the word means there. And, and then the, look at the word enticed in verse 14. It, 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 that's a word that means it looks exciting. It looks, it looks attractive. It looks satisfying. It looks fulfilling. But as you can see, it has a hook in it. Your inner desire, you, you, your lust is attracted to the bait. It interests you. You feel the pull, the lure. Where does that attraction come from? Where, where does that lure come from? What causes you to take a natural, God-given desire and express it in a way outside of God's boundaries? Where do those desires come from? Where does the desire for sleep become lazy? Where does the desire for sex become immorality? Where does the desire to eat become gluttony? How do convictions become anger? And a desire to love leads you to lies. And the desire to worship becomes idolatry of something in your life. And the desire to enjoy things becomes jealousy. And the skill you have to lead becomes power, all about power and control, which results in strife and, and disputes. You see, where do all those natural desires that God has given you, where do they get the lure and the temptation to fulfill those desires in a way outside of the boundaries that God has set? It comes from your old nature. It comes from the flesh that is within you. It comes from that old man. Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit. 
and the Spirit sets its desire against the flesh. For those two are in opposition to one another. And then further down in the 15th, excuse me, the 5th chapter of Galatians, we are commanded to walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So here is where you stop temptation. Here is where you cut it off before it even starts. Here's where you cut it off right at the source by not being carried away by the desires and the lust of your old man, of, of, of your flesh. You see, no one put the bait in that fish's mouth. No, the fish bites. Because it has an internal desire to bite. So do you. So do you. You have an internal desire to bite at the bait. Because in that moment, your old nature, your old man, your flesh, won the war. Won out. And sin occurs when desire meets deception. And you are lured away from doing God's will. Then the second thing. Ken, put that back up on the screen. Temptation leads to death. Now, verse 15 is almost like... <laughs> when, I, when you read this, when you study this, it's like a... It's almost like a train wreck because what James does here is he mixes metaphors. He goes from the metaphor of a fish being attracted by a bait in verse 15. When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. He goes from the imagery and the metaphor of a fish taking a bait to a woman giving birth. I mean, you almost kind of want to go, wait, wait, wait. Say, say, it's a mixed metaphor. It's, it's like somebody saying, boy, that may be hard, but it's not rocket surgery. Or so, sometimes when you roll the dice, it comes up tails. You know, you just the two things don't go together. But, but here they do. Conceive. Desire has united with deception and a baby is born. And that baby is called sin. And when it is accomplished, verse 15 goes on to say, the idea there is full grown. When that sin is full grown, in other words, when that sin that you bid on when that sin that caused you to take the bait is repeated over and over again, when you keep repeating that sin, when you keep doing it, when you keep taking the bait, every time you res your resolve grows weaker and weaker, and every time you do that, your resistance grows more and more fragile. Your temptation gets to the point to where your temper flares up quicker and you lose self-control sooner and the lies come more easily and your life becomes a living death because you are in bondage to that sin you live with that sin every day that sin dominates your will. That sin dominates that area of your life. One man wrote, sin takes you farther than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. It makes you stoop lower than any low. And it costs you more than you want to pay. Because your temptation has led you to a death-like existence. So what do you do? What do you do? How do you escape? How do you, get, how do you get unbound? Well, that brings us to the third thing. You have to know the truth. You have to know the truth. You, you, you know the details. You, you know the process. And now you know the truth. And that's verse 16 and 17. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Here's the truth. You do not have to serve your flesh. When you become a Christian, that old nature within you, that, that flesh within you is crucified. It is dead. Go home this afternoon and read Romans chapter 6. 
and ask God to sink into your soul the truths of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Christ, in order that our body of sin might be rendered powerless, so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And then Romans 6, 11 and 12 says, Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. You have to stop being deceived. You have to know the truth that your old nature is dead. You do not have to obey it. The problem is, is you keep resurrecting it. You keep bringing it down off the cross and letting it control you. I like the story of the old farmer who was talking to his preacher. The farmer hadn't been a Christian too long and he was struggling. He said, preacher, it's like I've got two dogs inside me. They are fighting each other all the time to be the lead dog. One of those dogs is a good dog, preacher. One of those dogs is a bad dog, preacher. And all they do is fight each other. Preacher asked him, well, which one wins? The old farmer replied, whichever one I feed, whichever one I feed, which one are you feeding? Are you feeding the old nature or are you feeding the new nature? Don't be deceived. Know the truth. The old nature is dead. Stop serving it. Stop feeding it. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and it is I who no longer live but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Know the truth. Stop being deceived. And then the second truth is, God is for you. That's verse 17. Nothing except what is good comes to you from God. Every good thing, every perfect gift, every desire that you have, all His good gifts to you, carry out those desires that He gave you within the boundaries He has set. And your life will be full of good and perfect gifts from your heavenly Father. He never changes. So be in the know. And temptation must go. You know the details. You know the process. And most importantly, you know the truth. Now let me give you three takeaways. And we'll be through. There are three takeaways. Here's the first one. Don't judge others because they sin in a way you don't. You see, that's that's, that's what we do. If that person sins one way, you would never sin that way. And so you judge them. You sin another way. But you're okay with that. So... Don't judge others because they sin in a way you don't. So try not to get all judgy. Try not to get all self-righteous. That's why when somebody asks me sometimes, how you doing, Pepper? And when I just kind of want to be just a little bit smart alecky, not completely, but just, you know, just a little bit. How you doing, Pepper? Fighting the flesh and trying not to be a legalist. And most days, that's how I'm doing. I'm fighting the flesh, and I'm trying not to judge you because you don't follow the rules that I set up for you to behave by. That's easy for me to do. It's easy for me to set up rules for you to behave by when I got all kinds of rules I'm breaking myself. So don't judge others because they sin in a way that you don't. Second thing is, know what your struggles are. Know what your struggles are. You you know what tempts you. I know what tempts me. 
You, you, know, you know what tempts you. And so steer clear of those situations. A man had a cast on his arm. He said to a friend, he said to a friend, I broke my arm in three places. Do you know what his friend said? Stay out of those places. That's right. I broke my arm in three places. Buddy, you need to stay out of those places. So you know what your struggles are. Avoid them. And then number three, keep pursuing the God who gives you nothing but good things. That's what you got to do. Keep pursuing the God who gives you nothing but good things. Because all those desires He placed within you are good, perfect, righteous, coming down from a Father of lights who loves you when they're carried out within the boundaries that he sets, you live a life and a life abundant, full of joy. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you today for just a letting us in to Temptations headquarters and just knowing how we get attacked. And I, I, I pray, Father, that everybody here can take something home with them today that's going to help them this afternoon, going to help them tomorrow, Father, when the bait is dropped in front of them. And I don't know what that bait is. I have an idea what the bait will be in my life, but in their life, Father, I don't know what that bait is. But, Father, I pray they'll recognize it, and I'll pray they'll remember what they've heard today, that it's the lure of the flesh that wants them to take a bite. It's the, it's the enticement of the old nature that wants them to swallow it. And, bef- and it's too late when we know, Father, oh, that had a hook in it. So, Father, teach us to crucify ourselves, to crucify the old man with its desires, and to come alive in Christ and walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. Father, I pray for these, my brothers and sisters, that we would indeed, every day, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for watching, listening to our service this morning. If you have a question about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, or if you desire to become a Christian, would you please send me an email? I want to help you. My email address is pepper at fbcmv.com. Or if you would like to know more information about the ministries here at First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, let me direct you to our website. Our website is fbcmv.com. And it is there that you will find a whole host of information about the ministries we have for your children, for your students, and for you as well. So the website address again is fbcmv.com. Again, thanks for listening today, and may you have a blessed week. I hope you'll tune in again and watch next Sunday.